I think my presentation is fairly concise. It's like what you just said, but it doesn't matter if you are sweating. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, wow. <laughs> you need some energy, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Don. Thank, thanks for coming. Yep. Good to see you again. Good to see you again. Uh, please take some coffee. Uh, oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What one do you want? Okay, wait. Thank you. Just say there's four different Thank you. Okay, well, it looks like blackberries, blueberries, and apples. What do you want? Oh, yeah, I want that one then. <laughs> Jeez. Project not good enough to make the first page. <laughs> <laughs> Mine's not on there either. There will be second edition, so if you have some uh, corrections or complaints, you can you can match them. Oh, I didn't know you were going to be here. Yeah, I mean, he sent me a message uh, today. Oh, That's going to be yeah. tough time for students now, huh? And I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm in the building. That's not right. Okay. Yeah. That's okay. Some people. Okay. 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 That's good. <laughs> yeah. How's, how's it yeah. yeah. Oh, I should have done that. Right. I did. So you look great. Thank you. 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 What? No, I think you might be. Wait. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. I think you might be. Actually, yeah, I'm So the, the uh, plan is after um, all presenters will come here, we'll do a little group photo and then we'll start the formal thing. Perfect. Uh, the, the, uh, the plan is that... Uh, hello, you as well. So you got the computational experience. <laughs> I don't know if it's allowed, but... Uh, <laughs> it's going to be good enough. You guys got... Uh, I mean, we, we, we have oh, another one. Yeah. Yeah. Do you guys have this from him every, uh, every week? Uh, Almost. <laughs> I know. I just <clears throat> Thank <laughs> you. 
I think so. See, all I need is this, and then that, and I can do that. Uh, no, this oh, is whoever goes first. Yeah. Goes second. Are you trying to ask me this? Probably. Offense? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Significant clear. Somewhere. Somewhere. Thanks for being I didn't know I didn't see so I can't read it, man. So we're missing Morgan and uh, Steven. Well, we have first two speakers, we can probably start below them. What, where are we going in? Huh? Are we going in? We are going in that order, and before we start, we'll do a group photo because oh, maybe. That order. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, 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 uh, we need to put something here in the second edition. And if, if they're missing to come, we'll um, put them by Photoshop. Um, before we start, let's um, just go and make group photo. <coughs> and the attendees and guests are also welcome to participate in the, 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 the photograph. <laughs> oh, okay, we got the last ones. Maybe a couple of seats yeah. so that we can see it. Oh, okay. Well, Morgan should probably accept to see if the call is on where it's just ending now. Yeah, that's true. Okay. And maybe take uh, the, the stuff as a. Yeah, we are here to do it again. Do it again. Yeah, please, please do. Everyone is welcome to, to join the photo. It will show that it was very high uh, attendance event. And if you decline to be on the photo, please. That's okay. Well, they got the, the three. Three is enough. 
Yeah, we're good. Uh, you may not want to have that uh, project, uh, you know, project something. Oh, like should that. we move like this way? Maybe move a little bit oh. to the... Uh, or, 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 or there's this, a way to mute them. Then he has it, so it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. Give a little bit to your side. So no, oh, there we go. Okay, okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have a few more questions. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, welcome to the last meeting of the Chem 364 meeting by the end of semester I finally learned the numbers. <laughs> so the goal of the class was to get basic principles that allow to interpret and predict outcomes of measurements in the physical chemistry characterization of materials at the basic level and uh, it went through uh, getting um, basic concepts of, of quantum theory. In addition to this activity at this of the of the course um, were very brave and uh, almost voluntarily decided to apply uh, their skills to um, problems that are very outside of the course area to practice their principles on something uh, unbiased. And um, the presentations today were completed in a time away from the class, in the like, labs or at home. And there will be uh, seven presentations of, I hope, arranged by the uh, subjects. So there will be chemical reactions, there will be a couple of dynamics of both electronic and nuclear degrees of freedom. There will be all the electronic degrees of freedom for electron transfer interfaces, and there will be several talks on the phenomena related either to spin or magnetism. Um, if you never, if you never seen Microsoft Windows and PowerPoint, here they are. And uh, the talks are placed on the desktop according to the order, first, second, third. So when it is your turn, please uh, come forward, click uh, on uh, your name and number, and start presenting. Ideally, uh, it would be great if all talks are limited within five minutes, leaving about three minutes for, for questions. It always gets a little longer, but we shouldn't uh, Override this time because uh, some of the classes we just need to have plans and uh, other exams. So, with this, I would like to invite the first uh, speaker, Yung Yu Hong, who will uh, tell a story about. Um, oh, I want to give acknowledgement to tech support to um, Daniel Erickson for this video conferencing, uh, for NDSU for MATLAB licenses, and for all colleagues who are coming uh, for to post Dr. Dr. Khan and Dr. Fatima, PhD candidate uh, Aaron Ford, who are assisting in the projects, and to all visitors for supporting this event. So with this, the first talk of Wendy uh, Hong is starting. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Zunbyo Hong, and my final project was about the fragmentation of lanthanum cyclopentadienyl. Um, <clears throat> which is the organic metalling molecules. My specific goal was to figure out the activation energy of the first barrier of the reaction pathway and understanding the faint result with wave packet dynamics and Arrhenius law. The minimum activation energy that I obtained from the MATLAB code was P0, which is initial momentum is in 60 atomic units. The methodology I used in the MATLAB codes were, were Hamil Hamiltonian evolution operation and propagation of the Gaussian wave packet as described in the slides. It was, able, it was able to observe the theoretical relationship between the initial momentum and the temperature, that the initial momentum was pr proportional to the square root of the temperature. One of the most important things done in the class was interpreting the data with Arrhenius law. The Arrhenius law shows the linearized relationship between the rate of reaction and the square root, uh, than the one over temperature. As you can see, the natural log of the 
natural log of the rate of reaction and one over T make proportional relationship in the chemical reaction that it was tested in the equation is applied to our reaction as well. After plotting the graph, we could see that the graph is linear and check the Arrhenius law would apply to my reaction as well. And from the Arrhenius plot, we can derive the activation energy of the relationship. Activation energy of the re reaction mathematically. We can see the slope of the plot of negative activation energy over R. If we multiply R to the slope, the activation energy can be, dri can be driven in the unit of the electron volt. And the, and the, um, the remind activation energy of the reaction is 0 0.474 electron volt. Um, to summarize, it was able to observe the activation energy of the fragmentation of LACP, which is the molecule of my interest, and also was able to see the reaction fit into the Arrhenius law. Thank you. That's fantastic. And uh, the presentation is open for discussion and questions. So the barrier is 1EB or 1EV? What is EV? It's probably a typo. It's EV, right? Yeah. All right. So <laughs> you gotta come wrong, right? Yeah. yeah. EV doesn't mean anything. Yeah. More, more questions? I do have one. Uh, proof. So you are fitting your numerical results for reaction rate. Yeah. Where do you get these rates? Where are they coming from? Um, they, they came from the MATLAB code. No, no, no. <laughs> you are considered an author of this code and you should explain the yeah. principles. So uh, where the rates of reaction come from? Um, Physical parameters. The, the, rate of, the, the rate of reaction comes from the slope of the, of the MATLAB code, uh, of the, from, the, from the MATLAB code obtained. So, um, yeah. So, so, so of, of yeah. What? what is your y and x? Um, um, the x? The x is the time, and the y is the, the product, the possibility of the product obtained. Excellent. This is correct. But where do you get uh, probability of product? And you may refer to your equations or explain by words. Um, the probability of the product obtained is Please show your equations. You may forward you may control them. Yeah. Equations, equations. Yeah, sure. So you're computing wave function. Yeah, that's right. As, as it goes in time. And mm -hmm. uh, how do you extract the probability of the product if you have a function at each time? And any of class attendees are welcome to uh, <coughs> I think right now I can. No, no, you can. You can. I can. You do. You can. <laughs> so please uh, show um, your dynamics. Uh, yeah. Okay. So what is what is moving? Oh, the, the moving is the wave packet of, of the, the initial molecule. But wave packet, what, what is it? Is it wave function or probability distribution? The wave function itself. But wave function can be negative, and your thing is always positive. Probability distribution. Mm -hmm. Okay. And when it uh, when it moves forward and back. Yeah. So right now, is it open ring or closed ring? Um, the starting point is the open ring, and the, uh, and the end point is the closed ring, because okay. it's the back reaction, and the, the the forward reaction is the opening reaction of the closed. Right. So, uh, how does position of the wave packet relates to probability of a uh, ring being open or closed? Um, greater the probability. Where? In which spatial region? 
just show in the on, on your display. Oh, um, so your your question is the, the probability of the open ring. Or yes, or probability of the of the oh. closed of the closed ring. Um, this point is greater at this point. But it is not point. It is a range. Range. Yeah. Which 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 range? Yes. Which range corresponds to open and closed? Um, this range is corresponding to closed string and this is corresponding. So you need to integrate your your uh, probability distribution over the range and the the probability of your product. Right? Yeah. It is what you wanted to say. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's thank you, uh, Yungu for a nice answer. And uh, with um, the next presentation will be by Alyssa Roberts. Uh, she was extremely brave to take a problem which is um, <coughs> At least twice more complicated than the previous one. In addition to nuclear degrees of freedom, she does have electronic degrees of freedom which are entangled. And the problem that she's uh, going to explain was a major part of the Nobel uh, Prize Award <coughs> of uh, Dr. Ahmed So, floor is yours. Um, okay, so my project was the photolysis of methyl iodide, otherwise known as iodine, iodomethane. Um, so, why investigate? Iodide, methyl iodide in the first place. So in organic chemistry, um, it is known to be a, the carbon of the methyl iodide is um, susceptible to a nucleophilic attack. And iodine is also a strong leaving group. So it's really easy to methylate products using this molecule. And then um, also it's very small. So it's slightly easier to um, demonstrate in, you know, that lab. So the products are easier to like interpret than a like triatomic um, like model. So like um, ethane, ethyl iodide would be significantly more complicated than methyl iodide. So that's part of the reason why we chose this. So what my simulations model is pump, pump, oh my gosh, pump probe spectroscopy. So it's a one femtosecond pulse that splits into two like sub pulses. One pulse is the pump, which excites the electron, and the other one is the probe, which detects it. And then, so the pulse is significantly shorter than the relaxation of it. So you can excite the electron without having it interfere with the re relaxation of the electron. So that is also the reason we investigate it. And different things that you can change are that the configuration, that, or, well, the configurations that you can change are the amplitude, the phase, the polarization, and the frequency. So those are just things that you can tweak to make it exactly the way you want to detect it. Um, so after it uh, excites, it relaxes into two different spin states. Uh, so the spin one half and the spin three fourths. Spin one half has a higher energy than the spin three fourths does. Um, and in literature, they're denoted as the I stars, the spin one half, and then the regular I is the spin three, four, three halves. And so the higher energy is seen here, and these are just the labels for the um, potential energy surfaces that we investigated. And this is the reaction barrier for just the breaking of the um, methyl iodide. So I'm not going to get into methodology, but it's all here. Okay, well, <laughs> uh, this is the initial wave function. Um, so it has a, a few different components to it. Um, so the, okay, I don't know how in depth to go, but uh, we have the Hamiltonian, the actual uh, equation for the initial wave function, um, the um, potential energy surface calculations, as well as how I converted the temperature in relation to momentum. So here are my uh, videos, that's the word. Uh, so this is the excited electron, and the electron is relaxing. This uh, red here is the overall probability of the electron to be in the two different potential energy surfaces. And then these little humps here are the uh, wave packets propagating as, um, the, uh, as a function of the bond between the iodine and the carbon. So as you can see, and this, this is temperature zero with a momentum of zero. So as you can see, as the, it propagates, the um, bottom one, which is the spin three has propagates significantly faster than the one on the top. It's uh, too many lines on this graph. Uh, so you have three different types of potential. So what is it? 
Um, yeah. The green lines. I mean, the green lines, which looks like a potential. Yeah, there's two different. There's so there's a. Um, Okay, so it's a. Um, so there's these two here are re relaxed to the same state, whereas the only there's only one state here. And off the top of my head, I can't tell you there's um, a, but it's in my it's in my report. I can't remember right now though. Um, there's different ways to get to that state. So there's um, I think it's two. I can't tell you, but um, it relaxes into two different. Two different states. So this state and this state, they both relax in the same way. But what is your potential? Can, can you show it on the, on the equations? Okay. Like in your slide with equations, uh, there are uh, potentials like uh, V of x. In, in are you talking about this? Yes. Can you explain what's the difference between V sub 0, V sub 1, V sub 2, V sub 3? Oh, so this is three lines based on these terms of four coming? Four. Four. Can you just briefly comment what's the difference of this uh, V not V1, V2, V3, and how it relates to the question of Professor Pilina? Wouldn't it be the well depth? Um, so the, the variations in the well depth would be um, what causes it to relax differently? Maybe that's yes, but you may highlight that there are four different potentials. Oh, well, yeah. You're... And uh, those four different potentials is what you are showing. Yeah, well, yeah. But what's the difference between them? Why do you need four different potentials? Because they relax in different manners. There's one that's uh, like a horizontal, I think that's what it's called, a transition. And then there's one that's, um, I can't remember. The, it would really help if I could remember the word right now. <laughs> um, but there's different types of relaxation. So there's one that. Um, you mean conservative and dissociated? Or something different? No, it's different. Um, Sure, I can't remember. Uh, but it relaxes in different manners. So there's just the three different lines, and then they end up at different spin states. Mm -hmm. So. So different products that are similar in energy. Yeah, basically. So two of them result in the same energy, and then one of them results in a different one. So there's three lines. The fourth line, I'm not sure what you're talking about. This is the. Um, this is electron. This is. These are the two probabilities. So the black and the green are the probabilities. This is the overall distribution. And these are the three lines that we're talking about. This is the um, non-excited state, mm -hmm. I guess. So there's no, since it's excited, there's no electrons on this non um, Yeah. OK, well, we'll continue. So the second one is a temperature of negative 194 degrees Celsius. So the Initial peanut that I chose was 10. And so as you can see, it's starting to get a little bit closer um, for the distribution as it's um, propagating. They start to get similar and similar. Um, I'm not going to let this go to the end because we have a time limit. So as it as temperature increases, they become more and more similar, basically mimicking each other, but the distribution remains the same. And I thought that was weird. So um, we investigated it further. So this time up here is a little off. So it's actually going from zero to further rather than from negative <laughs> to nothing uh, because it was simulated differently previously. So if we let the temperature oscillate the um, molecule beforehand, uh, it when it eventually will excite, um, the probability distribution will, will vary differently than it did at the same temperature. Um, Previously, so that was a little bit longer. So this is the same simulation, except for this one was isolating previously. So you can see that it's very different looking than what it it was here, where this one had nice lines. This one has very different, you know, oscillating features to it, and they probably at roughly the similar time, but still a little different. So if I were to do this further, I would allow it to oscillate previous to the excitation to allow it to actually simulate the molecule correctly. So anyways, um, my conclusions were uh, temperature increases the rate at which the I star state propagates, and then um, the propagation ratio varies if it's allowed to oscillate before it's excited. So that's it. OK, let's thank you. So any questions? Can you, can you explain your other two terms in your Hamiltonian? Uh -huh.
off by normal. And how did you choose the coefficient on those elements? Parameters? Um, okay, so huh. well, I did not choose it. <laughs> That's uh I think something that remained constant between all of them. No, I cannot. I'm sorry. But, uh, let's um, skip values of this uh, constants and uh, discuss just the operator part with this uh, cat and bra. In green and in uh, in your blue highlighted things, the uh, brand cat terms uh, have different indices. What does it signify? Oh, it's the transition between the initial energy state and the excited energy state. So just the energy transition between the two of them. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the the other one is the relaxation. Or is transition between between what? Three and two? Yeah. Yeah. Written? Partially satisfied? Okay. So can you return back to your Moody? So for the I guess my understanding is that at higher temperatures, which means this other uh, the mm -hmm. on the, the one on left side, right? So you excite to the highest parabola or not parabola, whatever it is. <laughs> so uh, in all of them, they're excited to the same point. And between these two, you can see that they're excited. But you start your initial right uh -huh. packet starts in the highest potential. Yes. Then it reaches a point where the both green lines coincide. Are you talking about like this point right here? Yeah, oh, it goes slow for the second oh, case, yeah, doesn't yeah, matter, right? Yeah. So, and then what happens with the packet after it's reaching this crossing point? Because, I mean, movie was... So it splits, basically. Mm -hmm. Splits? Yeah. Is it splits like 50%, 50% or you have I did not more the there, more there, and how the, it changes with temperature? It does look like it's... Uh, that's like why I... Um, visually, it does look like it's about 50-50. Mm -hmm. uh, I did not do the integrations for it, but just... Looking at it, it does. That's why we did the, um, I was confused on that. That's why we did this one here. Which and is this is for higher temperature, right? Yeah, it's, it's not exactly the same, but it, it coincides with this one. Um, so by oscillating it in the beginning, the, um, the ratios change. Uh, and that's why we did the, like letting it feel the temperature. Yeah, so if you change the conditions, then the splitting of the packet goes yes. with, so more goes down and less more stays goes on the up. higher. Because of the oh, more like, goes up, yeah, more goes up because of the higher energy available. Oh, um, okay. Oh, yeah, temperature high. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, it it still looks approximately equal, and I'd have to do the integrations to tell, but it definitely does look like there's a significant more on the upper range than there was previously. Uh huh. Um, it's just okay. Be the interesting. Part. Thanks. So you can control chemical reaction. <laughs> okay. Just pushing a button. <laughs> uh, so, a quick question. Uh, so, in your simulation, the temperature goes from minus uh, 200 centigrade mm -hmm. to 41 or something. Yeah. What is the typical temperature in this tower? Um, I think it would just depend on whatever you're doing it in. Uh, I think that they do it more like colder. I think it's frozen when you excite it. I'm not. 100% sure on that, like like just experimentally wise, um, but I would assume that it's not above room temperature that they would probably have to like have some sort of stabilization factor, so it would probably be pretty cold. So. Actually, I'm not sure who would guess what this would say, liquid nitrogen. <laughs> liquid nitrogen, so what is that, negative 70? Negative nitrogen or helium? Nitrogen is less It would be expensive. less than zero, I'm, I'm assuming. It's good to know because yeah. you know whatever you know we can throw in whatever number for a computer to do right. But, yeah. Uh, you know, you can about whether it's relevant to experiments or not. More questions to Alisa? If no, we thank her once again. A uh, question for Dimitri: uh, What is the scale for this great? Uh, if you have your opinion about uh, performance, so that's not like going from one to ten. <coughs> It, it goes. Uh, or should we just put A, B, C, D? Yes, it, it goes alphabetically, like same as grades A, B, C, D. Ah, okay. Um, just put A everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I try. So, 
Morgan will uh, uh, present another implementation of the same philosophy when the electronic and nuclear degrees of freedom are entangled. And he will try to identify similar features in uh, quantum dots. All right, so as uh, Dimitri said, I'll be doing my final presentation on polaron states for infrared emission in Perovsky quantum dot. So first, just like a real quick overview of quantum dots. They're nanoparticles of semiconductors, and they have these special properties due to their small size, and with this allows the transfer of electrons, which makes all this possible with the light emission when they're excited. And then a couple applications. Um, a huge application for this right now is TV. Samsung makes a QLED TV that uses this technology, which allows them to get these very nice colors with deep contrast. Um, another application uh, with the Perovsky quantum dots in particular is uh, solar panels, which is becoming um, a more used technology due to their high conductivity. So some of the important equations in um, in this project here, uh, obviously the Hamiltonian, and uh, there's a couple different stages of that, as well as the evolution operator, uh, which allows us to um, kind of see where these things are gonna be going, and then a few other uh, parameters here, and the Arrhenius equation, San Mateo's, um, looking at uh, activation energy. So there's a, a few different videos here. The first one is at a lower p naught, which is the um, initial momentum of this curve. Uh, it goes from the blue curve, which is the excited state, down to the, uh, the ground state, which is the red curve. And it is seen that um, the vibration is a lot higher in the ground state as compared to the excited state. slow but okay, slow is good. <laughs> <laughs> and then this is another one at a much higher initial momentum. Oh, and so this one ends up moving a lot quicker. And as you see in this one the ground state is taking a lot longer to fluctuate. It's got a lot less vibrational energy because of this higher initial momentum. And then, uh, so for some data collection, uh, the way that it was done is to determine the rate Rather than uh, being able to use the rate that was came out of the code, um, it is seen here that this it's averaging this um, this overall rate, whereas it has to just be done you know, y over x and calculating the the rate that way because of the drop off at the other end. That uh, that data is not good for the collection that throws off the average. And with this, the um, the Arrhenius plot was made using the uh, 1 over temperature along with the rates that were gathered. And within this collection of data points, there was on the two extremes uh, a lot of discrepancy in the data, whereas in the middle it leveled off and formed a, a nicer curve in which this plot was taken from. And here, from here, the slope is where we get our activation energy. Any questions? Well, let's uh, thank Morgan for presentation. <laughs> and uh, paper is open for discussion and questions. On your slide that had the uh, wave packet moving, um, you gave it initial momentum for 5 and 50. <clears throat> Do those have units? Um, yeah, it's just the atomic units. Two? They're satisfied. <laughs> <laughs> More questions? I didn't re realize how exactly, well, you're showing actually two level system, which electronic system, which is coupled to the vibrational 
uh, modes, quite syndronic, right? Uh, and you just consider the evolution of your wave packet going from one electronic state to another through the kind of vibronic, vibronic uh, levels. How is it related to the perovskite? Um, so this is, it's kind of simulating as the, the perovskite is excited through, in this case it was infrared emission, it's showing that as this electron is added, it's the shortening and lengthening of the bonds that creates this jump of energy. But can I say that, for example, let selenite is also has a, um, uh, the, 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 you can excite it at the, uh, in, in really like in the infrared range because it's very narrow band gap semiconductor. Then all this story can be applied to the, let's say, let selenite. Crystal. Oh, right? Like any, actually, it's not really perovskite. It's any kind of mm. um, semiconductor crystal with a small band gap where the excitation, mm -hmm. right, is in an infrared range or maybe um, near infrared range, right? Yes. Okay. And what can you advocate or add to? Uh, or something really about perovskite? Uh, um, the offset of blue and uh, red along x axis is bigger in perovskite materials because the bonds are softer. In uh, more uh, solid crystals, they will be over, all, almost overlapping. So technically, you can make this offset of uh, levels and then say, well, I'm looking on a different relaxation rates in perovskites or perovskites with this type of anions, like iodine, lead, or whatever, right? And this might be also kind of a force of parameters which you can play with. Yeah. Nice. Okay, thanks. Uh, I do have a question. And it is very challenging. Uh, do, do not fear if you cannot answer, just try your best. Uh, show you a erroneous proof. So, uh, when Jung Yu was showing his erroneous proof, <coughs> the slope was in the opposite direction, which means uh, <laughs> this increase of temperature rate was higher. Yeah, in, so in, in your simulation, this increase of temperature rate is getting slower. How do you interpret it? If, if you can. Yeah, initially when I was getting that, I was really confused because I was seeing, you know, when looking at other Arrhenius plots, and as well as Yungio, is it going in that negative slope? And I was confused at first, but then as I was looking back through the, the data that I was getting in my Excel plot, I was seeing kind of the opposite of what is traditional, and it was showing that as the temperature increased, with uh, as well as the P-naught was increased, the rates were actually decreasing. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but is it similar to what Alisa was showing for her case? No, the connection is no, no straightforward. But can you bring uh, your potentials or anything which shows your two potentials? Curves, parabola. All the two. Right. Yeah, for example, here. So, um, how does. Um, blue parabola on the left, at which point of red parabola it, it inter, uh, they intersect? It intersects at the, the bottom portion of it. Yes, and uh, here I need to add, you, you answered everything correctly, but uh, this corresponds to activation-less uh, transition, which gives absolute maximum. Um, and any changes to the system compared to this configuration, either increasing temperature or changing offsets, you only slow down the reaction. Mm -hmm. So um, it, this surprise is expected. Okay. More questions to Morgan? If no, I thank you once again. <clears throat> and we are start, starting next uh, chapter consisting of only one presentation. Kristen <laughs> uh, <laughs> Arthur. Um, her research project will be different from everything before. Her reaction coordinate will be not position of ions, but position of electrons. And there will be no nuclear motion. It will be only electronic degree of freedom along uh, uh, coordinate. And she is applying to some photovoltaic interfaces. Was yours? Yeah, so as Dr. Kilan said, my name is Kristen Patnam, and I'll be presenting on charge transfer <coughs> and electronics at the titanium dioxide agent. First, here I just have an image for you guys of the 
three-dimensional perovskite and then the one-dimensional projection. I'll speak a little bit on how we got the three-dimensional image into a one-dimensional projection in just a second. But just to familiarize yourselves with what this perovskite looks like in the MATLAB produced plots, you'll be seeing this throughout the rest of the plots in my entire presentation. So in order to first get that 3D image into a one-dimensional uh, projection, we had to collapse our three-dimensional potential into a one-dimensional potential. Um, to do this, you apply a double integral in order to remove your two uh, dimensions that we're not going to be using, and then we have normalization factor as well. Our potential is described um, with a relationship to our electric field, which is that capital E, um, which is going to be our main variable throughout, where that mu is just a constant. Our Hamiltonian is going to be used as well in order to uh, tell you our evolution operator, and so that Hamiltonian is also dependent on our potential, so we're going to notice a dependence of, of um, our probability of finding the electron in a specific space is going to be dependent on our applied potential. Um, that's because our evolution operator is dependent on that Hamiltonian, which is dependent on the potential. And so I just have a further explanation uh, to outline or identify that each different potential is going to correspond to a different electric field, um, which is just important to note. And you'll notice that in the plots, we do see a direct relationship between um, our change in potential and our electric Furthermore, in order to get a rate to determine how our electron is moving in and out of the perovskite semiconductor, we choose an eigenstate and then run our code initially. And then from that, we're going to plot a graph that's going to show us the population of the ex of electrons in our actual accepting agent versus in the semiconductor as a function of time and the rate of population we gain. And then in order to extract the rate from that, we'll do a derivative over time and convert that into um, a rate in picoseconds or inverse picoseconds. Here I have about one picosecond just to describe if we have an excited electron. You notice that at excitation orbitals about seven to nine, the rate of transition from electron in the semiconductor to the TiO2 agent was about one inverse picosecond. Um, it's predicted that at an excitation without excitation of the electron, that rate will be close to zero. So here I have an image to demonstrate what looks, what happens when you have a non-excited non electron versus an excited electron in the perovskite semiconductor. Without exciting the electron and without applying a field, there is not much movement in the electron. These are static images, I'll point that out right now. Um, but once you excite that electron, we see it's almost impossible to predict where that electron would be as the probability of it existing in any point of the semiconductor or the TiO2 agent. Um, is almost the same, so it would be impossible to determine where it is in that system. So then to give a few videos of what this looks like when we have no applied field and our initial eigenstate at no excitation, we're going to see the electron move. And then when we excite the electron, not much is going to change in that motion. You'll see some differences in intensity, but it's unlikely that the electron is going to move in or out of that semiconductor. However, once we start to apply a field here, I have just a demonstration of um, potential versus, excuse me, um, this is all those colored lines are eigenstates for each respective potential. Um, just to demonstrate what we're going to do, we're going to start at an initial eigenstate of ground, a ground eigenstate, and then excite it up to about seven or nine. And so in the middle is where we have no applied field, which is what we just looked at. And then we have both a negative and a positive field. And we're going to look at how those affect the electron's motion differently. So first, if you apply a positive field and you're at no excitation of the electron, the electron has a hard time moving outside of the semiconductor. To remind you, this middle section is our semiconductor. And then as we move this way, we get to our titanium dioxide accepting agent. So then once we excite the electron, here we've excited to a state of nine, we see a lot more motion of the electron and it actually makes its way outside of the semiconductor and even starts to populate that accepting agent. So then just to remind you, we're moving on to then apply a negative field. And again, we're going to start at an initial ground state without exciting the electron. And then we'll excite the electron again to a state of about nine. And once again, we see that almost static electron inside the semiconductor. And then as we apply um, excitation, 
you notice the movement of the electron. And in this case, we actually saw even more motion towards the left side of the semiconductor, which I thought was interesting. That's just, um, that, is, that left side is not our accepting agent. So further research would have to be done into why that happened. Also be interesting to do further work on optimizing photo excitation of the electron to see the most beneficial state of excitation to, um, to move that electron into your desired acceptor. And with that, I think, questions. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> And the presentation is open for discussion. I just have a conceptual question, so overall. So you kind of said that if you are in the ground state of, uh, in a parasite uh, area, right? So then your electron stays there forever, right? Is it really not, true? Probably not forever. Okay. Likely. What is kind of quantum processes we know should, should, should happen even if the barrier is high? If it's not infinitely <laughs> large, then what happens with the electron? Inevitably, inevitably it will move. It will widen out the tunnel, distance, right? Tunnel yeah. through the barrier. But this process is just goes very, very slow. The mm -hmm. probability is very, very slow, uh, small, right? right? So that's why it's not like it's forever be there. It still probably will tunnel, but you probably need to wait weeks to see yeah. this uh, some something appearing at the other side of your barrier. Yeah. More questions? Okay, everyone is happy. Um, you said that when it goes of so you said that you apply negative and positive field, and you and you also said excitation, but you didn't mean light excitation. It was not excited with light. Oh, sorry. What, so what kind of field, and what is negative positive? I actually know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> you probably do. Um, for the applied field, they will apply actually by natural. What current. kind of field? An electric field. Okay. Apply electric field to the conductor, semiconductor. Um, but then within our code, we were able to excite the eigenstate conditions of the electron. But what does it mean positive or negative? So you apply as a positive or negative voltage in other words, right? Yes. But uh, did you show what happens if you apply negative voltage? That would be this in the, this these videos here. And then the first set these are a positive voltage. I want to say it was point oh five and negative Just verbally describe how what's the difference potential in class or changes for positive and negative voltage or positive and negative field. Just verbally describe how the potential changes. One side um, forward. Yes. Because and there, there are three potentials. This field and uh, field of opposite science. science. Can you just um, verbally describe what's the difference in this thick uh, black curve? Because they look very similar. Yeah, so the primary difference that we see is actually on this left side. There's not, shouldn't be a change to the typing and accepting agent, but. But this is with which field? This is with field, right? Yeah, so this example is with no field. Okay. And then when we apply the negative field is on this side. Oh, I'm sorry, negative field is on this side. Um, and we, and on mean, that side going, is, going, on that side is your titanium, right? Yes, the titanium is all the way over. And on that side is your dye? Yes. Okay, so then what happens with the potentials plus minus? As the potential goes negative, our dye potential becomes a lot less uh -huh. defined and broader. Whereas when we have a positive, it becomes more narrow and more noticeable. Yeah, and for titanium, it's a backward behavior. Yes. Okay. So that's that's probably explains why you why you notice it goes either right or left. Yeah. Because you're really low in the barrier, either on the left side or the uh, right side. Huh. Can you, can you go to your uh, equation slide? It seems you you were addressing the yeah. The second equation. Potential. Yes. So your potential under electric field is getting constant constant slope, mm -hmm. where mu is your position operator. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So depending on the sign of the field, you you <coughs> get positive or negative uh, additional component. Yeah. Good. Um, question. Um, I'm wondering what are the parameters that go into the simulation. And for example, um, for every semiconductor, let's say that I get better, you want to get better. So what you're showing, does it depend on, let's say, the Bengal value of dioxide and titanium dioxide? Does it depend on any intrinsic properties of the material at all? Or is it very general that can be applied to 
any material. It's a good question. I didn't look into that yeah. in my try, try your best and uh, maybe point attention to the first equation on your, on your screen. The question is can you apply this to a perovskite material with different components? Or maybe not perovskite. What if you change your materials? Instead of perovskite, you use something different. Polymers. Could you get the polymer? Since it's dependent on potential and not necessarily the physical properties of your material, I would. But potential yeah. does depend or not depend on the intrinsic properties of materials. So, <laughs> so you can depend on your material. <laughs> but you could likely. And can you return back where you're showing how you go from 3D atomic structure? I think it is here. I mean, the image. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, here, right? So, right, look. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, <coughs> who was making this plot? Actually, is it you? Did you simulate this well, you, structure well, you or you from, took it from uh, somewhere? Provided by Dr. Han. By who? Dr. Han. Oh, okay. And how he was doing it, do you know? Did, did you ask him? No. <laughs> <laughs> but do you have a Maybe. Vision? Can you explain how did you obtain this? This foam, first principle. Okay, As a potential. Foam mass. Uh, do, do you think everyone, um, I don't know. I'm sure, I'm sure not everyone knows what is what. <laughs> Well, you need to, to apply right special code which allows you to calculate the yes. with some approximations you actually need to calculate the to, to solve the so is equation. It, <laughs> is it just the um, electrostatic potential? Okay. Um, so let's say you, you calculate the electrostatic potential from this wait, to wait, this wait. and you project on, on a two-dimensional. Yes. So it is uh, first principle data. Right. So you see, this is, you know, this care property is, is intrinsic to the property, uh, to the material that you're talking about, right? If you, instead of, um, if you replace, let's say, that of guy with something else, mm -hmm. the curve is going to be different. Yes. And then your final results are going to be different. Right? And if the molecule is different, then probably you also will have slightly different shape on the right side for the potential. Same for the yeah. Of course, very strongly depends on the material. All right. More questions? Let's uh, thank Kristen once again <laughs> for extending the, the, the questions. <laughs> and now we are starting the uh, last chapter of, of three sections. So uh, if you uh, first uh, you were presented by Amelia Anderson and uh, she will uh, help us to recall principles of uh, war theory, which is behind atomic spectroscopy. Yeah, so like you said, my name is Amelia and I did my project on the 2D rotation of a war model for non-equilibrium orbitals. Uh, some of the equations I used, I um, Use this first equation, which was um, which converts angular momentum to polar coordinates, so we could um, plot the um, angular momentum in a way that we can understand it on the Bohr model. And then the second equation is uh, it shows the difference between kinetic and potential energies and how they're related to Hamiltonian. Uh, my methods, I used a MATLAB code written by Dr. Killen, and then um, I added the commands to automatically save the videos. Um, so I could upload those to YouTube later, so I can add them to my presentation. Um, I changed the numbers of nodes and then reran uh, the code so we can uh, see how the nodes changes the angular momentum of the electron movement. And then we analyzed how, uh, how those nodes affect the movement. Um, so here is just a polar standing wave. Um, and the red line on there, they're all kind of overlapping, but just imagine with me and we'll see them on later plots. Um, the red line is the real part of the wave function, and the green line is the imaginary part. And then the blue line is the combination of those, which is the red line squared plus the green line squared and the absolute value of that. And then um, the blue line shows the um, stability of the electron in each node and orbital. Um, so if the blue, um, later in the videos, if the blue line is um, 
pretty much unmoving, then the electron is going to be more stable. And if it's moving, then the electron is not stable and will um, quickly change so it will become more stable. And then it's less likely to undergo a transfer to a different node. Um, so here's the first node. Um, we, or I ran it with 1.56 nodes, and the, you can see the very quick movement of both the red, green, and uh, the combination of the two in the blue line. So um, when there's not an even integer <coughs> number of nodes, then the, uh, then the electron is a lot less stable, and it's going to try to get back to a more stable state. And then the second one, we did 2.02 .02 nodes. Uh, so clearly, those movements are a lot uh, more stable, and the combination of the red and the blue makes, or the red and the green makes the blue light unmoving. So this electron is uh, pretty stable in its condition. And then moving forward, here's 2.64 nodes. And um, this is unstable once again because it's not an even integer. Um, and then finally, here's three nodes, 3.01 nodes, and um, this is stable once again, uh, and that blue line is unmoving, so it's uh, happy in its current condition. And then, um, so conclusions for this project was as the number of nodes change, the radius from the nucleus increases as the number of nodes increase um, if we go back and just compare the, um, the radius of each of these, it clearly gets larger as we move forward and find the largest at three nodes. And then, um, yeah, as I mentioned before, the even integer values create smoother movements and um, more stable atoms. And then the value of orbitals is two times the number of the nodes. So uh, there's one positive and one negative for each node. And then finally, we looked at limitations of the Bohr model. So it's only a 2D model. Um, so it can't show uh, 3D movement. And uh, that led to the lack of understanding of what the electron would do in a 3D space. Those are some references in your notes. OK, thank you, Amelia. We end the presentation is open for discussion. So you, in your conclusions, you said that you need the integer number for the for the nodes, right? Yes. So in other words, you need to quantize uh, your, your momentum, your angular momentum should be quantized, yes. right? And this is very valid, of course, statement, mm -hmm. which you proved. However, you didn't show the results with 300. Zero, zero. You were showing 301, three, zero, three, two point something. Yes. Was it some, is it an issue to get exactly the even number for your code? Um, or you just didn't show the results? Because it's, we, it's not interesting. <laughs> Well, there's that, but um, the code <laughs> did not run as well with completely even integers. We wanted to have um, three uh, significant figures in each value of the nodes. So we just ran it not completely equal, but we got it as close. So in other words, there's some bug in your code which not allowing you to really get exactly integer number. Yes. So there's maybe some uh, numerical errors which Yes. Results that you need in a kind of a, a little correction, and you cannot really get the exact even number. Yes. More questions, please. So, um, can we use this simple picture that you got to understand any no observation in experiment? You got any simple experiment that? Some experimental data um, where we can use this picture to understand. Um, I mean, you could use it in a multitude of different experiments if you're able to. Um, this is kind of atom by atom, not the complication of a molecule. So, um, yeah, the blue line just, if it's stable, then the electron is going to be less likely to transfer. But if you're looking at an atom where um, the blue line is moving all over the place, then the electron is going to be more likely to transfer. And that we just, well, I looked at it as. The electron is more likely to transfer from the atom. Yes. Or move to a state where it can be more stable within the atom. But can you really give some example of this 
experimental evidence of something like that. Like is there a connection to hydrogen? Some experimental hydrogen evidence of the Bohr model. <laughs> Um, uh, I did not look into that. Come so on. You can, you can. What exactly is the reason why Bohr created his model? There was very clear need from experimental side why he really stopped working on it. And how he proved that his model is right. Um, uh, he looked at... Um, Let's go to your questions. Maybe they will help you. So you, you asked the question, uh, what does it tell? Um, at the values of even integers of nodes, the... Um, don't exactly know. So what, what is H? Which, and uh, which um, observable, which dimension it corresponds to? Momentum, position, or start with letter E. <laughs> Observable, it, uh, eigenstate of Hamiltonian, but it can be kinetic or potential. Energy. Yes. Good. So if you plug in uh, the quantized values, or if you um, look that you have integer number of nodes, what will be the values of, of energy from this Hamiltonian equation? Would you get different energies for different uh, values of your quantized L? And how is it changing? <coughs> if L grows, energy. So energy. Energy grows. Mm -hmm. And because L is quantized, then what happens with energy? Like L cannot take something in between because then your atom is not stable. Mm -hmm. Then you really need to take all integer numbers for L, right? Then what, how does it affect the energy? Does energy continuously changing when you? Or it takes only discrete values. Takes only discrete values. Discrete values which depends on this L, right? Mm -hmm. And now go back to experiment. How does the hydrogen, uh, the spectral hydrogen atom looks like in the visible range? It's very discrete values. Actually, there are four discrete lines, mm -hmm. right? And this was kind of a main puzzle. No one could explain before Bohr. Why is it discrete? Why is it not kind of a distribution like mm -hmm. you see from the black body radiation, which is just spread it kind of distribution in all, over, over all energies, right? Yeah. And this exactly explains if you have one single electron in a hydrogen atom moving from the ground state to the first, <coughs> the first second, and so on, excited states, right? Results on the discrete energies. If they go in a visible range, you really can see them just by eye. And, and this is the evidence of this uh, model. It works. He was able to use this model and predict this energies, which then were compared with the hydrogen atom spectra, and they looked very nicely for that. Mm -hmm. Agreed. I'm not sure what you were thinking about yes, this experiment. Yes. <laughs> I mean, you know, people propose a model for purpose. Mm -hmm. They were trying to understand stuff. And this way it came from the yeah. So I was going, I mean, I wanted to see the connection. Yeah. Right. More questions? Morgan? No? It's not questions, it's applause. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody. So we have uh, two more presentations. Uh, Stephen uh, will be the next. And um, he, his presentation will be very much different from anything we heard before, and very much different from anything uh, you may have heard in the previous years of this class. So instead of uh, looking on either electronic or nuclear degrees of freedom, he will look on spin degrees of freedom. My name is Stephen Rushton, and I'll start with Phil and said I'll be talking about the spin degrees of freedom. So we can hear you. Can oh, you sorry. Do, do, you, do you need to launch uh, the presentation mode? Oh, right, right, right. I can't tell. I'm a little nervous. 
All, all I've had to eat today is coffee. <laughs> so, as you can take, if you are not in the good mood to skip over. Hello? Uh, yeah. Can you all hear me now? Yeah. Yep. So, my name is Steve Marcher, and as Dr. Kellen said, uh, I'll be talking about uh, spin degrees of freedom in electrons and specifically the free induction decay of electrons and antimons in NMR. So first, uh, we're going to have to cover some theory, since as I said, mine is very different from everyone else's. So that would be, what exactly is spin? And that is a very hard question. <laughs> if it wasn't, I'd probably have a Nobel Prize winner. So it's an intrinsic property of electrons and other fundamental particles, which doesn't really tell us anything. It's uh, more actually, it's a form of angular momentum of a particle. Probably the analogy, it's a ball that's spinning, except it's not a ball and it's not spinning. So then what is it? Well, specifically, the spin number of an electron is the eigenvalue of a wave equation for the k number of states where the wave function is an eigenfunction of s hat z for the summation of k terms of s hat z k. So that would be the uh, basically the z uh, value for a uh, a vector of uh, magnetization, basically. So that allows us to see that they'd be represented by a sphere, basically. That'd be a block sphere. Well, what is a block sphere? It's a geometric, geometric representation of a qubit where the poles of the sphere represent the zero and one states. Uh, more usefully, it's a way of visualizing the magnetic vector of a spinning electron as it moves uh, through a magnetic field. So we have our magnetic vector is equal to uh, g su summation of k of the s k of time t, where the s k is the combination of the x y and z components of the vector, which are controlled by uh, these uh, equations, which I will show later. So now, what is a spin echo? So as the magnetic moments of a, a group of electrons move around a block sphere on, around the equator, that at one point in time, they will synchronize and constructively combine their signals into one very large signal. Now, the exact time that this happens for an atom is unique to each atom and to each electronic environment, also how it's bonded uh, for every single state that there can be. This is the principle behind how NS NMR spectroscopy and differentiate elements and atomic structure this way. And now we have a very, very messy graph. So what's happening on this graph is that all of our uh, electrons in the magnetic mode in the ensemble start at the same level. The uh, pulse, the half pi magnetic pulse that brings the electrons from the poles of the, mag of the block sphere onto the equator, which is represented by these two lines, at which point the varying uh, individual frequencies that they move around the equator, uh, which is dependent on their individual electronic environment, cause them to diverge into these various uh, purple and yellow orange lines until they reach the pi poles, which uh, flips them 180 degrees in the sphere. And as you can see, that changes the way. So that now instead of diverging away from one point on the sphere, they are now on the opposite side, converging towards a separate point on the opposite side which is represented here and here. And so we have two identical signals, despite the fact that they are now in different places in time and space. And so a more useful visualization, if you can't really wrap your head around that, we have our electrons here at the top of the block sphere, which are then moved to the equator by the 90 degree or half pi pulse, so that they are now in the xy plane of the sphere. They then Proceed, the various uh, electrons, since this is more than one, move in various ways around the sphere at different rates, and that's such uh, they counteract and destructively combine to reduce the total of the signal that you would see. This is until the pi pulse is uh, received by them, at which point they flip to the opposite side of where their positions were originally on the sphere, and they now begin to converge to a single point on the opposite side of the sphere. So, a nice thing I got from Wikipedia shows this in a smooth motion. Mm -hmm. And you see that 
at one point they converge on the opposite side and uh, form a new signal even though that there shouldn't be any uh, magnetization present. Now what did I do exactly? Well, as the electrons move, they move at different rates. The, specifically it's called the, uh, the, the disorder is the variance between uh, each individual magnetic moment as it moves. So, I stated earlier, they are defined by the summation of the x, y, and z coordinates, which are defined by various differential equations. The important uh, variable in this is the plus or minus i delta omega k. They do so at different rates. The difference between those is defined by the delta omega k. So here are the two electrons, the, not the, the two formulas that I used earlier in the uh, formula to divine, define the uh, magnetic vector. And here we have the delta uh, omega k uh, components, which are the important factors. So in the MATLAB code, delta omega k is represented as a multiple of omega. As you can see here, the original was uh, 0.015, where this can be rep x represents any uh, value that would differentiate between the different uh, speeds that they move. With x is uh, starting at 0.01 in 0.025 increments uh, up to uh, 0.02. So what does that look like? So here we see the signal that you would receive on the blocks here, where as they move around the uh, equator at different rates, they destructively uh, counteract each other's signal until they converge at a single point and we see a sudden surge in signal on the opposite side. Now, graphed to link to the YouTube video that uh, Dr. Killen helped me put together of, that I took that from. If we graph that, we see this sort of graph where the, uh, the orange and blue line combined represent the uh, measured magnetic signal. Now, as you can see, as disorder increases, this is uh, 0.01, uh, 0 0.0125, 0 0.015 and increasing so on to 0.02, the uh, width of the peak increasingly narrows the larger the disorder is between them. So this is a very important as uh, the width of the peak uh, is a limitation in the resolution ability of an NMR to distinguish different uh, electronic states. So if we draft that as a combination of the area of the peak over the multiples of W, we see this very smooth uh, sloping uh, trend line as the disorder of, uh, of the state of the magnetic moments increases. And the, it says T2, I'm sorry I did not uh, define what that is. T2 is the relaxation time, the time that it takes for an electron that's been put through a magnetic uh, field and been brought to the XY plane to return to its initial uh, sort of state after it's removed from the electronic field. This uh, value is different for every uh, element and is part of the, the way that spin echo is used as a way of uh, determining the, the state of the atom. So what happens if we make the disorder really, really large, like seven times as large as the original one that uh, we started with? And something very interesting happens. The total area of the peak completely breaks down and the, it loses all symmetry. There's no symmetrical large peaks on either side. And what I'd speculate about what's causing this at this point <coughs> is that the disorder is so large between each individual magnetic moment that they aren't able to uh, immediately constructively rephase into a single point. By the time the first ones are rephasing, the other electron magnetic moments are still far around the sphere and by the time the last ones are rephasing, the first ones have already returned to their initial values. Question? Okay, but thanks, Stephen. <laughs> now we're almost 10 minutes. <laughs> and presentation is open for discussion. Yes? You mentioned that this is kind of applicable to the NMR spectroscopy. Yes. But then you were also talking about, like initially, I think you said it several times, that you talk about spin of an electron. What is used in NMR? What kind of spin they use? Is it for electrons or for something different? Might have confused me there. But the important part is that 
Um, so, so uh, it doesn't change the overall, I'll say, physics and uh, formulas which you were showing. Algebraic processing in the atom, are there anything else spin which has spin? Or oh, it's only electrons which do have spin? Yes. What about protons? All uh, elementary particles and quarks have spin. However, in the nucleus of an atom, they believe they are counteracting. Is proton a fermion or not? No. Pro a proton? A single proton? Yes. <laughs> proton is a fermion, right? But if, if, yes. if you quit, if, if you talk about nucleus, right, it depends on whether you have given or odd numbers and they might be not have So in NMR, it's the same idea, but my understanding is that they talk about the spin of the nucleus, spin of the protons. So in, in your talk, you can uh, replace only one letter if you want to speak about electrons instead of NMR, or EPR. EPR, yes. Mm -hmm. More questions to Steven? If not, I thank you once again. Please don't leave it here. So the uh, next presentation uh, is by John Swanson. So um, his presentation will be also very unlike and similar to anything you heard before. In the uh, recent uh, year, or couple of years, there was an interest to uh, so-called two-dimensional quantum materials, and uh, John was brave enough to try to apply uh, skills from the course for uh, exotic materials. Are you in a mood to speak loud, or you need to... I'd rather speak loud. Okay. <laughs> um, hello, my name is John Swanson. I will be presenting on the correlation between eigenstates as the magnetic field is changed. Um, so getting into that, um, just brief overview, not that people don't know what superconductors are, but a uh, superconductor is a material which can move electrons from one atom to the next with no resistance. And so this is often researched on low temperatures, bringing metals down to low temperatures, they can become superconductors in many cases. Um, but one area of research that maybe isn't as is looked into or known about is the application of magnetic fields um, to form superconductors and metals. Because I know metals oftentimes, when they are superconductors, give off magnetic fields, but inducing them with a magnetic field may have um, a similar result to bringing it to low temperatures if we look into that a bit. So, some basic methods of research. Um, there's a MATLAB code that was used to do this experimentation. I'll get a little bit into what was behind that. And so, through this, we um, took the eigenstates that were found through this code, and they were converted to density of states um, across energy. And then that was used to determine if a superconductor could be formed based on how the density of states um, reacted. And so some equations that were helpful in doing this, um, this first equation relates the Hamiltonian to energy in the eigenstates. Um, and a lot of these are really intertwined, so actually doing this computationally may be incredibly challenging, which is why a code was used, because I'm not sure I can do any of this by hand. Um, second one equation right here, we found, um, use the energy found in the first equation, um, and use in the first equation to find the density of states. And then moving past that, this equation is used alongside this. Once this is solved, and it can be plugged back in, as you can see here. And then this is just an equation for the Hamiltonian with L sub z being angular momentum, V sub z being um, magnetic field, and both of these are actually in the um, momentum um, space and not in any position. position. Yes. What is LU and H called? Okay, so LU is the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, highest occupied, and so for this one, lowest is um, calculated using positive, highest using negative. So, and so a little bit of a representation of this last code here. Um, this is this cone is kind of what that equation looks like when mapped out in again in the momentum space. And this ky and kx are represented as px and py here. Um, and so the top is the lowest unoccupied, bottom is the highest occupied, um, corresponding to positive and negative. 
And then this over here is a material that this could be um, researched upon. So this is the top. This is a lot of layered on um, business telluride, and it's just one of the um, lattices of that. And so this is something that the experimentation done could be done upon. Okay, so for the actual data, um, at the bottom here, the areas are the eigenstates um, across energy that were found through the experimentation. And above each of these um, is a corresponding density of states that were found um, when converted. So these first three, this is throughout the slides I'll show. This is as the magnetic field increases. And these first three are pretty similar. As you can see, this is the density of states um, of the poles where there weren't electrons in the uh, lattice and then of the electrons found. And the dotted line you'll see is the combination of the two of those. So nothing really too interesting here. Um, as the magnetic field is increased even more, um, it was starting to see that there was a bit of a dip here, which started to grow, as you can see in that last one, almost forming a peak. Um, and then finally, um, here we can see this is the strongest peak that was found through this experimentation. I'm sure it could be found stronger if you were to get to closer values, but this is what was found. Um, and then it started to dip down. And so what was determined from seeing this peak in the density of states is that it is evidence for a superconductor. Um, I believe you can look at, look at Fermi's uh, golden rule for showing that when the density of states increases at a specific energy um, so sharply, it could indicate that a superconductor may be formed. And so again, it, it flattens out afterwards, but that is as a magnetic field is increased, that is something that is known to happen for density of states. So that doesn't prove this is true, but it gives further evidence that this is reliable. Um, and so this is just a video of all of those kind of mapped out, kind of what that would look like. Just for a little bit of a better visualization of the density of states over time. Okay, so some observations that could be made here, again, by Fermi's golden rule, um, we can claim that as density of states increase at one specific energy, that um, we could maybe see a superconductor being formed. And so um, further indication of this was found when looking at the eigenstates of the found through this experimentation. And so I'm not going to show all of them because there's a lot, but um, I picked a specific few. So when the B field is zero, uh, I believe this is the first eigenstate and the third one, um, according to our graphs on an earlier slide. Um, there's relatively little to see here, which indicates there's little motion. Here. And so as we move up in the magnetic field, this should be um, negative 2.33 times 10 to the negative 5. Um, there is a lot more fringes here, as seen by the second eigenstate and fifth one, so I believe these two are. And the fringes should indicate that there's further motion within these eigenstates. And that continues up to um, negative 4 times 10 to the negative 5. Um, and this is at a much higher energy and a much lower energy. But as you can see, there is a lot of um, activity going on there, which further indicates that there is motion, which would lead you to believe that maybe a superconductor could be formed under these conditions. Yes, I so yeah. this is just different eigenstates at the same um, uh, at the same magnetic field, right? You no, fix no. the strength, so, you, so or you're changing it. This this is magnetic field is zero. This is increased to two point three three times seven. Which is kind of optimal, where you really see yeah. the formation. Of and then the the largest peak was seen at this one, um, and so this is at a higher energy. But this is as the magnetic field is increased. This is just a couple of the eigenstates taken out of that. And so observations, again, I said, as the fringes increase, that we just believe that there's an increase in motion. Um, and there are the eigenstates, and my units are not quite great. But they're there. Can't change anything. Um, and so basically what I took out of this is upon induction of a magnetic field, it could lead us to believe that a superconductor could be formed under the right conditions, which I think is something that's very interesting. So thank you. Questions?
Yes. Sorry, I'm going to run a little bit of question. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're ready to upload the Infinity. Okay, Alyssa. Um, can you go back to, uh, just keep going, I'll take this out. Can you go back to the question about the Infinity Pool? Yes. Um, so on the first one uh, that you have, why are the states less one? Why is like, this keep going up? There's like, obviously not like plateaus. Do you know like why it gets so weird? Like, like, you mean with? Um, nope, the bottom graph. Here? Yeah. Um, oh yeah, because they're not, so this dip, um, I know I looked into it at some point. Um, I think it indicates a change in the motion, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but I'm not entirely sure why it goes from, you know, the tiers to that kind of steadily increasing pattern. I guess they're just because I guess they can probably be taken from different spots that aren't necessarily in one um, plane um, because I guess they are kind of correlating to this conic shape. Um, but I could be mistaken in that. Uh, great question and, and answer is almost complete. <laughs> Can you uh, uh, indicate our attention to magnetic field equals zero? And uh, count how many uh, degenerate eigenstates you see if you start from lowest. Here? Yeah, no degeneracy for the lowest. And next one, how Four. many? How many? Four. How many? Four. Four. Yes. Four. Okay. Now let's go to your eigenstates at the very end. I mean here. Eigenstates, not uh, Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. yeah. So um, can you explain how this degeneracy 1 and 4 relate to uh, your eigenstates with zero field? Hmm. So this is at zero energy. Z um, zero magnetic field. Zero, thank you. No, zero, zero magnetic field. And so. Um, at the degeneracy of one and four, you can see that both of these are um, well, they're basically the same, at least in this, which indicates that at both state there is little interaction, but I'm not exactly um, sure that's what you're getting at. Does momentum, uh, he's on the right way. <laughs> we will complete this one. And thank you much, Elisa, for for great question. Um, is momentum changing or conserved in absence of magnetic field? It appears to be conserved. Conserved. So uh, if you create a state with very certain value of momentum, delta function of momentum, is there any mechanism to, to disturb it? No. No. So uh, on your grid points, for different values of momentum, please keep, keep this uh, again. On uh, any value of grid point, the delta function certifying very specific value of momentum will be an eigenstate because there are no reasons to change eigenstate. Great. And uh, if you take uh, square lattice grid points, how many nearest neighbors are close to? Point zero. You, you already answered, but let's uh, focus on the uh, back. This is zero point. <laughs> <laughs> How many closest neighbor to this point along the grid line? One, two, three, four. In all of them, you have the same value of uh, energy because it is proportional to value of energy. So it's four degeneracy. And if you despite of the cases of one degeneracy, one degeneracy, can you go back to your uh, degeneracy images with magnetic field zero? And can you maybe, but yeah, can you now uh, repeat the same to Alisa and pointing right uh, things on the I can do my best. So here, um, momentum is conserved as we go across. And so the closest four um, are seen up here to, what was your question? You, because your question, <laughs> your question <laughs> was more based on. Your question on, was why it's so smooth. Yeah, on this first, one. Uh, 
rather than well, all and then it units. goes back to being like when it goes back to deep, it goes back to being normal again. I guess I I don't I was just wondering if there was like a, a reason why it goes way. from I, I get exactly what you're asking why it goes from the tiers to kind of a more curved pattern and then back to the tiers again. Because of the discrete nature of, of grid points. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So it could be a num numerical artifact. If okay. we take finer grid points, it may disappear. Okay. More work. Yes. Right, can you get back this slide with a picture of uh, Bismarck Telluride? Yes, for sure. So Bismarck Telluride is a narrow band gap in the bedroom. Band gap is our zero point one something. Mm. I like them both. So on the other left, you show something which is more like metal, more like graphene. And it I don't see any band gap in the hand. So do you think that your model on the left can be applicable to the material on the right? I think a similar model might be, but maybe not this specific one. Um, this is more of an example of something that has been used with superconductors that this may be able to be applied for, because I know this has been used to insulate different things on computers with um, just some research that has recently been done. But I'm not sure if this exact model would be applicable to this. I mean, the whole idea is that you, I mean, you can use uh, a quantum field to manipulate the electronic state Okay, then that's it. Okay, my question is very simple. <laughs> um, do you know of any example of real material where they observe, um, you know, conduct, uh, superconductivity by, by applying uh, a magnetic field? In my research, I could not find anywhere that this was um, observed in any material, but um, this was more just to show that maybe it could be found to be applied to some material, but um, I could not find any evidence of a material that has been shown to have that um, functionality yet. Uh, have you seen an opposite effect when increase of magnetic field so, uh, limits the conductivity? Like your regime when you keep increasing it. Hmm. Yeah. Values. Well, um, eventually, like if you look <coughs> here, um, as the magnetic field is continually increased, eventually it does start. It, it lowers the conductivity. Lower the conductivity. This this is very standard effect observed in experiments. So half of these results <laughs> agree with experiment. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's good enough. <laughs> the other half is more the the part that would be interesting to put further research into based on this evidence. I don't know, that would be in my eyes. Um, you know, when you have enhanced, the enhancement of the electronic, um, electronic, electronic space at the Fermi level, it may lead to superconductivity. But yes, you know, it doesn't mean that if you had enhancement, yeah, you have to have a conductor. Right? Yeah. It, you may have it. Yes. Okay. It's necessary, but not sufficient. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. More questions to John? I have a general question, which is kind of related. Oh, I would say the answer to my question was already answered mm -hmm. in a question from Han, uh, uh, Kang. And um, so technically, this Bismuth telluride, right? So it's referred to the so-called Dirac materials because uh, it's not small semiconductor. It's a Dirac materials, means they completely close the gap at one point, mm -hmm. right? And uh, what other materials do you know which behave in the same way? Well, that's a wonderful question. Um, and anyone from audience may uh, help to answer this question if it takes from the time. I do not know of any names directly. You should. Um, I should. This is very common material. I would be very surprised the, if you have never layers? seen it. <laughs> because I know graphene works in yeah, this is one. Yeah, this super. is the most common one, right? Yeah. So, uh, but there are of course more than one yeah. material like that. And technically the computational chemistry was applied to create some kind of a predictions or database. They tried to go through many variations of possible semiconductors of multiple combinations, metal, non-metals, mm -hmm. whatever. And calculating electronic structure, the, the, the dependence energy on the band uh, on a, on a yeah, on the key points and checking whether you can get uh, uh, direct materials or not. And yeah, we found about hundreds of materials as predicted. Some of them not synthesized yet. 
More questions to John? If no, please uh, join me in. Uh, and uh, last uh, note that uh, probably all visitors will agree that uh, it was a successful presentation. Please submit if you did this uh, form and class and attendees can also do this. Um, so the exposure of uh, class attendees to unbiased uh, problems was a chance to practice your knowledge in more real life environment and uh, there is a hope that it will um, help to keep part of the knowledge more um, long lasting in your memories and it will eventually help in uh, your in other classes like inorganic dcam2 uh, computation chemistry which all you are invited to take and uh, in your academic teaching or industrial careers with this uh, let me thank uh, all speakers and uh, participants of the discussion Yes. So may I just make a comment because I was coming for uh, Dmitry is teaching this course for about four four times already, right? For three. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I was I was coming for this presentation of students from previous mm -hmm. years at least four. I think it was four times already, and mm -hmm. I really was amazed with your presentations as a group because usually yeah, there are of course good presentations, very good presentations, but there are really presentations which are kind of very weak and very people don't know what they do, we don't know how to ask questions. I was very very pleased to see that. All, how many eight people who were presenting really showing very very good understanding level of understanding was very high and overall presentations were just interesting to listen to you it was interesting to see what you were doing so really I think as a group every of you was really I don't know I, I have I'm very excited seeing your presentations really great work guys okay. and this uh, with this meeting is dismissed <laughs> and class is complete. <laughs> so I can, I forgot to say that I, I you know, fully agree with Tatlata. I'm a very really impressed with you guys uh, from the you know, presentation skills. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's much better than any other events that I've seen. Um, yeah, be proud of yourself. <laughs> yeah, lots of improvement. We are proud of you, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great job. Yeah. For whatever reason, like it builds up speed and like drift out the side. It was seven, but I consider eight is my number. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Han. I really appreciate your support. Also, I have an answer to your question. Um, oh, yeah. there's like, um, well, you're asking about the potential for challenging curves, and there's parallel and perpendicular curves, so one of them has like, a so like that's not so it's it was in my so it's like a like it's like how yeah and and 2.3 is like 